So this uh, part is going to be about the like ACGME procedure requirements. So what the requirements are, like kind of the language and the rules, <clears throat> our role in helping them obtain them, and then just a couple tricks to not help them meet the requirements, but you know get more than they need and make sure that they pass and are competent. So um, the procedural requirements I'm going to talk about first, and this is like the ACGME procedural requirements. So um, what I'm going to answer is what and how many of these procedures are required for graduation? Uh, what is the faculty or the attending role in supervising these procedures? And then ways to help meet the minimum numbers, specifically with some of the more rare procedures. So this language is pretty much straight quotation from the ACGME. So not only do they have to meet the minimum number of procedures, so they have to be able to perform all the medical, diagnostic, surgical procedures, they have to meet uh, the minimum numbers of what are called key index procedures, which we'll see on the next slide. So specific procedures that are required to graduate from an emergency <laughs> medicine program. And then the program director has to verify the records of all the resuscitations and procedures as part of a semi-annual evaluation. Uh, in addition to just meeting the numbers, we also have to assess their competency, which really just means that they're doing them correctly. So not just that they've done 35 intubations, but they're doing the intubations the right way. Um, and they have to demonstrate it to us. And then the program director essentially at the end has to just formally sign off on all this. The key index procedures for emergency medicine are shown right here. Um, these are the ones that the ACGME has just deemed essential to the independent practice of emergency medicine. No more than 30% of these can be simulated with the exception of certain rare procedures, which are usually pericardiosynthesis, cardiac pacing, and cricothyroidotomy. So if you look at the list, this is stuff that we pretty much do every day with the exception of some of these rare ones. So um, these are things that they have to get over the course of, in our program, it's a three-year program, so over the course of three years. Uh, the procedures, since they're residents, they have to be supervised. So there are two types of supervision that are um, really applicable to the way that we're, we structure things in the emergency department because we're always there. The first is direct supervision. Uh, certain procedures have to have direct supervision, and that's meaning the supervising position is physically there. So if the intern or the resident is intubating somebody, we are physically right there with them while they're intubating the patient. The other type that we have in the emergency department is indirect supervision with direct immediately available, which basically means that we are in the hospital, we're in the fishbowl, we're somewhere around, but we're not right with the patient and the resident performing the procedure, but we're immediately available in the proximity if needed. So this is, they go sew their lacerations, they drain an abscess, and we're around, but we're not, we're not watching them. Um, and then just a couple tips on how to get get the residents the procedures. Um, the, the first thing is we actually have to do them with them, and then we have to provide the supervision and teaching. So don't turn procedures to other specialties is number one. Uh, if there's an opportunity to do a procedure like a thoracentesis or something like that, do it yourself uh, and have the, or have the resident do it and supervise them. The other thing that's been helpful uh, are these things which we've called HALO procedure labs. HALO is uh, high acuity, low occurrence procedure. So things like pericardiosynthesis, cricothyroidotomy, stuff that us as attendings don't do very often. So if we're going to supervise residents, we have to be comfortable doing these procedures themselves. So at least in our group, we had the cadaver lab a few years ago. Uh, there was another procedure lab at St. Joe's in their sim lab in, the, in April. Um, so by refreshing the competency and the competence of the faculty, it allows us to want to do these procedures and gives us more opportunity to supervise them. The other thing is working together. So allow senior residents to supervise juniors. So, you know, there are some times where it's difficult for us to get supervision in, our shift is ending, we're really busy, we have more patients than the residents, and we're not always able to supervise, and that can slow things down or, or make a, a procedure not less likely to happen. So allow the seniors to supervise the juniors. Um, as far as multiple residents per procedure, I, they can only log one. So if you have two residents that are both assisting with thoracotomy or a pericardiosynthesis, only one of them can log them. 
Um, so if you have a senior resident that's already done 50 innovations, you know, they're going to help an intern. They can get the, the uh, intern to log the procedure, uh, and that will help meet the minimums. Uh, simulation and didactic, something that we do quite a bit, uh, mainly for the low acuity, or sorry, the high acuity, low occurrence procedures. So cadaveric procedures, uh, use the sim lab, um, and then any type of procedure specific models. These can all be logged uh, in their logs. And then documentation. So they not only have to do them, but they have to log them, and then we have to sign off on them and sign off that they're competent. So uh, this is something that really I'm doing with Dr. Bunting, but we have to make sure that they're actually on top of their procedure logs and we check them and see if they're on track to meet the minimums and then do this in a timely fashion because you don't want to wait till they're six months out and they've only logged one delivery, uh, vaginal delivery, and then you have to find a way to get them more. So keeping on top of the residents, making sure they're doing their administrative task and try to identify any deficiencies as far as their numbers is important to do it in a timely fashion so you can correct them if you need to. And that's all I have.